Hi. Can you all hear me? Good, good. It's good to be here. I, uh, I was actually here uh, when I was a little kid, two years old, living in Lübeck for five years. And uh, even to this day, I, I can understand German a little bit, but, but I can't speak in hardly a single word, so I have to give the speech in, in English. I'm sorry about that. Um, playfulness, spontaneity, what a, what a wonderful theme for a, a conference like this. Um, I think that uh, spontaneity and playfulness is, a, is, a, is really is one of the roots of our profession and, and, uh, and what design is all about is these kind of unexpected creative breakthroughs that, that we always strive for. Uh, before I begin, I would really like to know how many of you are graphic designers? Oh, yeah. How about industrial designers? There's hardly any here. Uh, how many of you work for the advertising industry? And, and finally, how many of you are students? Good. A lot of students. Oops. Um, I, I grew up in the 40s and 50s. I'm, I'm almost 65 years old now. And uh, I grew up playing around in nature. I, I was living in Australia at the time, and I remember uh, swimming in rivers and coming across uh, poisonous snakes that can kill you and, and, and red-backed spiders that can bite you and, and, and the blood goes up to your heart and you, uh, and you can die. And, uh, <laughs> and I... I it was wonderful playing around in, 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 in that kind of a nature, actually, with all the danger and everything else as well. And I, I especially remember one incident that happened to me that I have never forgotten. It's a, one of the most playful incidents that I have ever lived through. I was walking over a hill, and, uh, and as I came over the hill and I looked down into the valley below, then I saw what must have been uh, 10,000 rabbits. They, they, it was incredible, like thousands and thousands of rabbits and they were all playing around in a kind of a tribal frenzy. And then suddenly they got a whiff of me. They suddenly realized that there's something up there on top of the hill and they all disappeared in about three seconds, two seconds. They were all gone into their holes. I never forget that for some reason. That was the most playful thing I've ever seen. And, and I grew up in this kind of a natural uh, environment, and, and, and I, that, I think, made me into a kind of a, an optimist. I, I, I feel optimistic about just about everything. And I must admit that I have a hard time understanding the cynicism of, of, of many people these days who grew up in the electronic environment. But, uh, but lately, maybe it's because I'm getting uh, a little too old and too close to death, I'm not sure, but lately I must admit I feel a kind of a dark feeling that's creeping over me. Um, I have a feeling that uh, right now the, this human experiment on planet Earth is, is hitting the wall in many, many ways. I think that... Uh, Ecologically speaking, we are, we are hitting the wall now. Nature is dying, wilderness is dying, ecosystems are dying, species are disappearing every day. You know, you, I, I meet a lot of German people who come over to, to British Columbia just to see a little bit of wilderness, just to see a little bit of, of, of some totally undesigned space. A space where human being has had no, no, no influence whatsoever. And, and they come there, I think, because they, in this kind of a totally undesigned space, they, 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 it's possible to have some kind of a profound, sometimes even a mystical experience. But, but now that 
you know, you really have to look to find any kind of a, a wilderness these days. And, um, and one of my great heroes, a man called E. O. Wilson, he's telling us that, uh, that we are now living through the, the sixth biggest mass extinction in human history. And then to, to, to complicate matters even, even more, I think that we are hitting the wall psychologically. So there is uh, some studies that show that, uh, that there has been a 300% increase in mood disorders, anxiety attacks, and uh, depressions over the last two generations. That is quite incredible the, to, to see this mental sickness, you know, going up almost exponentially in two generations, 300%. Uh, and the World Health Organization study is predicting that uh, by the year 2020, mental disease will be bigger than heart disease. And I, th I think that this is a very dangerous thing because we're losing, uh, we're losing our clarity of mind. And, and maybe if we lose enough clarity of mind, then it will be impossible for us to, to solve some of those uh, terrible ecological problems that we have to face now, like, like climate change and, and, and peak oil. And then, to make matters even worse, we're hitting the wall politically. We're caught in this never-ending war against terror. And one of the root causes of this war against terror is this incredible difference between the rich and poor people of the world, where the rich one billion people, and that of course includes us and, and, and Canadians and, and Americans and Japanese and so on, one billion of us, one billion, 20% of the world's population, 1 billion people, we consume 85% of all the, the goods in the global marketplace. So what does that leave for the rest of the 5 billion people on the planet? Well, it leaves them with a lousy 15% of the global pie. And then we wonder why they hate us so much and, 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 and why there are some barbarians at the gate now and why we have to uh, fight this never-ending war against terror. So I think that uh, we designers, we have to ask ourselves, how do we fit into this world that is hitting the wall on the ecological, the psychological and the political fronts? You know, where do we fit in? Well, I think that, um, that we designers are, are, are incredibly powerful people. I think that very few of us uh, see ourselves that way, but I think we are very powerful people. We are the, if you think about it, we are the, the people who, who make the trends and we create the fashions. We, we are the, 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 the cool makers and the cool breakers. We are the people who, who create the, the look of a magazine. We, we are the people who, who create the the feeling and the tone of, 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 of television or the, the give and take of the internet. So, in, in the sense of, of Marshall McLuhan, we designers, we are the, the creators of the medium rather than the message. We are, we are the people who have some control over the, over the medium. We are the medium of the message. Uh, we are the creators of meaning. And I think that uh, that more than any other profession, I think that, uh, that we have the power to change the world. But uh, graphic design, uh, what is it now? It's about, uh, about 100 years old. Um, and, and graphic design has a, has a, a quite a wonderful, uh, inspiring kind of a history. I mean, the history of design is, is full of uh, you know, Bauhaus and constructivism and de steel and, and, and I, I must admit I'm totally inspired by when I go back on those old movements because the people in those days, maybe their ideas were wrong and many of their ideas have been proved wrong, but they had a kind of a passion that was, is really inspiring. I mean, these people really believed that they could change the world and they had 
they did their graphic design in a, in a spirit that, that perhaps uh, has been lost to some degree. Uh, and I look back at people like Hartfield, he's one of my big heroes, and, and I must admit I'm totally inspired by, by his work. But, um, but, but the, recent, uh, the recent history of design is, uh, is not so inspiring. I think that uh, designers today are, are going through some kind of a identity crisis. You know, we, we sit in front of our computers and with our hand on the mouse and, and we're pushing those pixels around the computer screen and, and I honestly don't think that we know who we are anymore. Who in the hell are we? What are we doing? Why are we doing it? Are we, uh, are we artists? Some of us are, I guess. Not too many. Are we graphic agitators? Are we... Well, yeah, there are some, some graphic agitators. Uh, I, I know some of them quite well. People like Jonathan Barnbrook and, 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 and even to some degree Stefan Sagermeister is a guy like that for me. Uh, but even, even some of those uh, graphic agitators now, I can, I can count them, you know, on my one fingers of my one hand. There's maybe only five of them in the whole world that I that can really respect. Um, so are we, are we packages of information? I, I, think, I think that's closer to the truth. I think we are we, we are the people who, who, if you work for a magazine, you take the text from the editorial department and, and then you, uh, you, you, you package it in some some very interesting way and, 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 and I, I think we really are, we are packages of information and, and quite often the, the people who take the text, uh, the, the, the art director who takes the text from the editorial department doesn't even bother to read the article, it's just a matter of taking the text and packaging it to make it look glitzy and good and nice. Are we corporate slaves? People who just do what the clients tell them to do? I think to some degree we are. We, we, we are really quite subservient to our, to our clients. And I would argue that uh, somewhere over the past uh, couple of generations, we, we designers have really lost, uh, lost something, uh, something really valuable. We have lost our, our, our mission, I think. I think we've lost our, our plot. We have lost our storyline. I would go so far as to say that, to some degree, we have lost our soul. I think that uh, to try to explain, you know, why, why we have lost this soul, I, I started thinking about it, you know, before I came here, and, and it seems to me that, uh, that one of the really big curveballs that has done something to design is, is, is just modernism. This is, of course, modernism has been changing everything for the last hundred years, so it, 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 you know, it's, it's been the driving force, not just behind design, but behind all of our culture behind architecture, behind everything for the last long, long time. And now uh, when I think back about modernism and what it has done to us, I really think that in some very profound way that modernism has, has somehow, somehow fucked us up somehow. Um, and I think we're just starting to wake up now to, 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 to how it has done that, to, to what this really means for us. Um, and uh, I got a real deep insight into, into this, uh, what modernism has done to us when I read a book by an American designer called uh, Natalia Ilin, is her name. She's actually from Russian heritage, but she, she's now uh, in, um, in the United States of America. And, and she wrote a book called Chasing the Perfect. Um, and she told this incredibly profound story about, about how the during the First World War, the young people of the time, that young generation who, grow, who was growing up at that time, how they were sitting in the trenches of the First World War, and they had these brutal experiences, and some of them had this experience of watching their, their compatriots, their friends, caught on the barbed wire of in front of them and they're howling there all night for mercy to be just be allowed to die so they don't have to suffer anymore and and then maybe at four o'clock in the morning 
Finally, they die and there's quiet all over the trenches. And they lived through this kind of a brutality. And, and then they, after this, the First World War was over, then they go back to, to the real world. And then they become the, the people, the founders of, 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 of the Bauhaus. They become the, the Gropius. They become the leaders of, of this, uh, these movements, these modernist movements. And, and, uh, and they are idealists. They are people who, who, who just can't take any more brutality. They, they, they just want to create this utopian, wonderful world. And, 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 and I think to some degree, I, 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 I would go so far as to say, even though it sounds a little bit flaky, that, that modernism, modernism was somehow born out of fear. And sometimes, when I, again, when I stand behind some art director or some, some designer, uh, and I watch them pushing the pixels on the screen there with their hand there, and they're all obsessive, and they're all looking for that perfect thing on the screen there, that nice balance and that, that perfect jazzy colors and all the rest of it. Then I feel that same kind of a yearning for an idealized world that, uh, that I think uh, was born there in the First World War. And, and I think that that kind of a fear still in some way lurks behind design today. So the second big curveball in, into, into the design profession, I think, is just simple consumerism. I, I mean, we, all of us, we, we designers, artists, uh, architects, all of us, everybody, we all got caught up in this incredible wave of consumerism that, uh, uh, that came after the, the, the Second World War. I mean, it, 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 it has, for the last, uh, it has increased our consumption by, by, by factor of three, it has changed our, our, our culture, authentic culture, to a consumer culture. It has turned citizens of a democracy into consumers. Um, and, and for the last 50 years, you know, the money has been flowing, the bucks have been flowing, and we've, we've all become really, really quite well off. Um, and of course, uh, we designers, we are somehow behind that flow. We are the we are the people who keep some of this capitalist, and, and I'm not a lefty, I'm not using the word capitalist in some lefty, old lefty way. I'm not, I don't like the, the, the left very much at all. Uh, I want to jump over the dead body of the left, actually, but, but I, I, uh, I, I feel that, uh, that, uh, that we designers do keep the, 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 the capitalist flow going. We are the people who, we are the, one of the driving forces behind uh, consumption and glitz and cool and, and helping the corporations sell more and more stuff all the time. And, and we are the ones who help to sell more, a lot of this stuff. And, uh, and I think that, um, I don't know exactly what, this, what the design schools are like here in, in Germany, but in uh, Canada and the United States of America, when you go to school, then uh, design school, then, then you are taught how to, how to serve your clients the best way. You are taught how to, and I'm going to be very rude here, you, you're actually taught how to kiss corporate ass. <laughs> this is to use Jeffrey Keady's very provocative term, which I found a few years ago, and I still love to say it in every talk I give. Or to... to to, to borrow another term from another American designer who I really respect, a woman called Catherine McCoy. And she said that we designers have become like, like prostitutes. Practitioners of the so-called oldest profession in the world. And now I'm quoting her words, who must maintain an extreme of cool objectivity about the most intimate of human activities, disciplining their personal responses to deliver an impartial and consistent product to their clients. And I, I think it's true. I think most, of, most designers today, they, they spend a good portion of their creative lives catching the eyes, catching the eyeballs, stimulating desire, producing desire, and moving the merchandise. And I think that, uh, I wonder how many of us, 
can even imagine what it feels like to design something outside of the capitalist imagination. So, having said all these bad things about design, I, I, I have to tell you that, uh, that I do feel that there's some sort of a resurgence going on. I, I feel, uh, especially among the young people, uh, many of whom I've talked to ever since we launched that uh, First Things First manifesto, uh, I feel a kind of a new vitality among these young designers, these students. Um, I think that among these students we have a few mavericks again, some of that old passion of the, of the old uh, the movements of design. And, and uh, I think design has, has some, some really nice new possibilities again, and it, it, it is starting to get really interesting again. There are some interesting possibilities and interesting twists. Um, and I think there's some interesting mind shifts going on in, in, in design today. And we're at the very early stage of many of these, design, of these mind shifts, but, but they're happening and, and, and they're very exciting. Uh, I think the very first big mind shift that's happening in our profession right now is that, that we are going green in a, in a very big way. Um, there's a kind of a greening of, of design going on, a greening of our profession. Um, and I think this is one of the really wonderful, great trends happening in, in design right now. Um, many of us are, are going beyond just simple eco design, you know, and just trying to be coming up with sustainable products. We we're actually becoming deep ecologists. And we're pioneering, I think, a, a different kind of an aesthetic, an aesthetic that's somehow more organic and, and it gets away from that modernist perfection and, and then it somehow feels down to earth and, and, and I don't know what the, what, the, you know what the next big aesthetic will be but I feel that, that there is some, it's got something to do with, with you know, the earth uh, and, and life, living things. Um, so I think we are pioneering a new kind of aesthetic and, and we're, learning to, we're learning to play. We're learning to play again in the in, in this great kind of a playground of nature. And we're including the, this whole idea of nature in, in, our, in, in, our, in our thinking and in our designs and in, in our aesthetics. Uh, maybe we're becoming a little bit like those rabbits that I saw when I was a young man in Australia, learning how to really play again. And, and for me personally, um, I, I had my epiphany about this uh, one day when I was flipping through a some sort of an art book or design book, and I came for the hundredth time, I came again across Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Waterhouse. Uh, but this time, I don't know, I must have been in a funny mood, or maybe I had a couple too many vodkas or something. Um, and this time, instead of seeing the, the house, I suddenly started seeing the trees, and, and, and then I started Seeing that oh, behind the trees, underneath the trees and the earth, there's the, the roots of the trees, and, 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 and there's, a, there's water that's flowing right into the earth and flowing all around it. And I started to hear the water, and then I could feel the, the sunlight somehow coming in there and working on the leaves with the, the photosynthesis. And, and then somehow it got kind of got a bit of that same mystical feeling that I, I remember having a little bit when I saw the rabbits. And, and I, I remember even thinking, wow, I can just see the snow falling here tonight. And, and, and I started feeling some of the patterns of the snowflakes in, in, that are going to fall here tonight. And, and I suddenly realized that the design, the really good design here, isn't really the house. It is the billions and billions of years of human evolution, or not human evolution, of, of natural evolution. That is the really fantastic design here in this picture. Uh, and. Uh, and then I, uh, I came to the, this is the moment when I realized that my ego is just too big. Uh, and that, uh, uh, that nature, nature in every way is a far, far better designer than I will ever be. I think the, the second uh, big mind shift that's, that's this curveball that's going into our profession now is that we're starting to, to play around with not just the, the glitz and the marketability and the, the usual kind of uh, uh, market-related uh, properties of, of our products, but we're starting to play around with the, the psychological side of the, of the products that we design. Um, so somehow the, the mind shift is away from the, 
the glitz and the saleability to, towards a, a kind of a what will happen to this product when, when it's used by the user? How will the user feel? Uh, how can we manipulate the, the behavior of the user? And I think that this, this thinking about how the product is used, not how it's purchased and, and how great it looks on the shelves of the shops, but how it's used, maybe for five, ten, maybe even a hundred years after it's produced, it's going to be used, and, and how is it used, and what, how does it change the behavior of the, of the user? Um, and I wanted to give you very quickly a few examples of, 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 uh, of what I call psycho design. This is a really crazy example of psycho design. It's, it's, a, it's a vodka glass, uh, and it is designed to, to take some blood from your lips when you use it. Uh, I know it sounds crazy, but, but it's a good way to introduce this idea of psycho design because. Uh, imagine that you're an alcoholic and your mother or your, one of your friends gives you this glass. It's, it, makes you, it makes you think it, it's something that sitting there, even if you don't use it, it's something that is constantly reminding you that, uh, that, uh, that somebody that you love is, you gave you this glass and, and that you have a problem in your life. Um, another example of, uh, a good example of psycho design is this, uh, what I call a TV cozy. It's, uh, I think it's more powerful than a, the tea cozy that the, the British people use. Um, and I think uh, I can imagine uh, a lot of people, uh, I don't know exactly what it's like here in, in, in Germany, but in North America, a lot of people are, are TV addicted. You know, the TV is on all the time. Um, they, people turn on the TV as soon as they come into their apartments and, and, and some they sit there, you know, staring at it for hours on end. And so imagine one day in a house like that where there are a few TV addicts, suddenly somebody puts this on. And it's suddenly, it's not possible for you to pick up the, the remote and just switch on the TV anytime you like. All of a sudden, somebody's saying, no, don't do it. Somebody in the house is going against you, sending you a message. We're watching too much TV. And I think that if you think about it, that simple design of a TV cozy, it changes the whole mood in that house, in that apartment. It, it changes the whole psychodynamics of living in that apartment. A very powerful piece of psycho design. Uh, another example that I really like is this squat chair. It, uh, it's a chair that is unstable. It, it, uh, you have to learn how to balance. Uh, it's not just something that you can plonk yourself into and, and, and go to sleep. Uh, and it's, it's a really good chair for people who are overweight. And it, who need to take off some weight. It's a reminder that, uh, that life is to be on the move and not to, not to sit there like, like an idiot all day. Another example that I really like is this uh, electricity meter. Uh, and I remember a, a really good uh, friend of mine who, who was one of the co-authors of the Club of Rome uh, book uh, many, many, many years ago. She, she died now. Um, she told me this story about how the, the manager of a of a housing complex was trying to reduce the energy consumption of, of uh, all the different uh, houses and apartments in, 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 in her complex and, and nothing seemed to work. So one day she decided to, to take uh, this meter that usually was hidden somewhere in the back rooms and nobody ever saw it and she decided to put it right next to the, the entrance to the house. So as you're leaving the house you, you, you're opening the door and you see it right there, you see the thing going around. And, and it reminds you that every time that you leave the house, every time that you come back, it reminds you that you're using energy. Uh, and she found that after she installed those meters next to the, the door, that the energy consumption in the whole housing complex went down by uh, 30%. Just by a simple design of putting it in a, this meter in a different spot. Um, I think that the, the hot water tap is another incredible example of, of uh, an opportunity for designers to, to, to manipulate the, the behavior of, of the users. Um, I mean, there's all kinds of ways to change a, a hot water tap. You can, you can use color coding, you can use red for danger, or you can, you can take it so that it's hard to open. You can make it really hard to open, or maybe you can make it so that 
in the beginning it doesn't open, but then you have to wait for two seconds and then it opens. Or, or, or maybe you can put a filter there on the spout or make the spout very tiny. Um, one of my favorite tricks would be to take the Japanese uh, symbol for eternity, this, uh, this uh, symbol that you see that in a drop of water, that's the symbol for eternity, and to call it uh, an eternity tap. Uh, and, uh, and this, if you put a brand, if you make an eternity brand uh, hot water tap, then it will remind people that, uh, that energy and water is forever, that uh, future generations will have to use uh, good water and, and have good energy for, for thousands of generations to, to come after you. So eternity is, is a nice uh, brand name, I think, for a, for a tap. And imagine... Imagine millions of people all around the world using taps like this and, and how much energy you could save. And, uh, yeah, so there's, I think there's a lot of work that we can do there, just, just, just in a simple thing like changing the design of a tap. Another good example is, is what I call a carbonometer. So that uh, instead of uh, when you press the accelerator, instead of just the speed of your car going up, it shows you how much carbon you're pushing out of your tailpipe. It shows you how much global warming, uh, how much carbon you're doing there. and and, and I wish I could have a carbonometer in my car. If, if I had it, then I think that over a period of time it would change my driving habits. It would completely change the, the way my relationship with my automobile. Uh, the final example of, a, of a psycho design is, a, is what I call a, 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 a sort of a community tool shed. Um, Imagine that, uh, you know, right now, the, the, I don't know what it's like in Germany again, but in, in North America you have a, a block of, of a community and, and in every house they have their own lawnmower, they have their own drill, they have their own hammers, every, all the tools, everybody's self-sufficient, everybody has their own castle that they live in. But now imagine that there was a designer designed a, a very easy to use tool shed where, where uh, you can go on the internet and you can find out if the lawnmower is there, and if it's there, you can go there and you can take it out and it's a very high quality mower that's used by everybody in the block. Maybe while you go there, you can meet some other people who are going there to pick up something else and all of a sudden you're rubbing shoulders with your, your, your neighbors. And so if you think about it, if, you, if we were able to design neighborhood tool sheds, then we wouldn't just be uh, saving a lot of energy because we would need less tools, but we would actually be creating neighborhood solidarity. We would actually be teaching people how to share. So this is, it, it would change the whole personality of that neighborhood, I think, over time. So, so I think that, uh, that psycho design is, is one of those areas of, of, of creativity that we designers can, can, can really start thinking about. I think that the, the third, uh, one of the third big mind shifts uh, or curveballs into our profession is this realization that we have to have some sort of a ethical base. We, 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 at the moment, design seems to be rudderless. We, we don't have anything that we really believe in. And I don't think that it's very easy for us even to explain what we're doing to our children. I mean, what is really design all about? What, you know, coming up with a, some glitzy product that, that sells a thousand uh, units and, and, and makes a client happy or what? Uh, so I think the realization, one of the, the ways that we can get an anchor into our profession is this, this realization that, that just like doctors and physicians have for thousands of years, we designers should do no harm. Uh, and I think that... Uh, um, I can explain, I think, uh, by giving you this example of a, of a leaf blower. Uh, you know those leaf blowers that the gardeners use to sort of push the leaves away and it's very noisy and it pumps out a lot of, uh, a lot of pollution. Um, and um, if, if somebody, a client asks you to, to design this, uh, this leaf blower, then, then, then maybe you can make a very simple calculation. You can say, all right, the... This leaf blower has a life of about uh, 10,000 hours and, and maybe the noise and the pollution is, is worth uh, maybe 10 cents every hour. So, so the minus part of this, uh, of this leaf blower is, is, a, is a few thousand dollars. And, and then maybe you can come to the conclusion that it's not a smart idea to design another leaf blower. Maybe, maybe you can convince the client to do something different. Maybe you can ask them to, I don't know, come up with a leaf composter or come up with a new easy-to-use rake or some, some other way of doing things. And, um, 
and I think that uh, if we were able to come up with uh, this idea of doing no harm and, and, and having a, a true cost uh, product so that we designers calculate the true cost of every product we produce and if it's in the minus, we don't produce it, we don't design it. So every product we, we produce should do no harm. It's a very simple idea. I don't know if it's a very new idea, but I think it's something that we can explain to our children. It's something we can explain to our kids. And it's something that can be kind of a, one of the ethical bases of, of, uh, uh, of design. And then actually in, in, the, in the science of economics right now, there's a mind shift going on from, uh, from, from uh, economics, uh, from the neoclassical economics to true cost economics. And if we designers started to think seriously and pioneer techniques for measuring the true cost of, of a product, then we would be well ahead of the curve. So, um, after the, this First Things First manifesto, I don't know how many people have heard of that, but, uh, but certainly one of my great heroes of design, Tibor Kalman, he, he, uh, he was part of that First Things First manifesto. And, and ever since that manifesto was put out five or six years ago, I've been talking to a lot of young students and young designers who who are not really very happy with their profession and who are dreaming of, a, of, of being part of a profession that, uh, that really means something so that they can spend the rest of their life being involved in, in, in something that really means something. And, and, um, and I think that many of these designers, they, they want to get involved in the ecological and the psychological and the political side of, of design. Um, they want to play around in the political arena. You know, why, why are so few of us designers uh, playing around in the, in the political arena? I mean, the, the, the tradition of design, if you look back at the old movements, then, then, then maybe we need to look at the, the kind of political design that those people, those early designers did many, many years ago. And, and we need to revitalize the, the confrontational and the oppositional traditions of design. I think this would be a wonderful curveball into design if we could start to be boldly political again in, in, in some of the work that we do. And then I, I'd like to make a, a few very uh, simple predictions now. I, I, I hope that over the next few years that uh, we're going to see a, a changing of design. I, think, I hope we see a few rougher clothes, for example, uh, or, and, and rougher offices where where the feeling is not this sort of a sanitized, fluorescent kind of a mood that I see in so many uh, uh, design offices. I would like to see some rougher teachers in schools. Um, I would like to see some rougher books, not the usual kind of show and tell books. And, and actually, I, I have just finished a book called Design Anarchy, which, which uh, I'll be happy to show you later if you, if you come and see me. Um, I think we need uh, rougher magazines not that kind of a clean, modernist-looking, commercial-type uh, magazines that we have now. And, and um, yeah, and maybe we'll even change this kind of a, the way that we ourselves dress and, and get away from that same old, slick old black that, we, that has become so traditional in, 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 in design clothing. And, and now I'm reaching the end of my talk here. I, I don't know how many minutes I have left, but uh, um, in closing, uh, I wanted to, to say that uh, that I hope that this, some of those aspects of this uh, new design culture that I've been talking about today, I hope that it keeps on bubbling up and, and I hope that some of you uh, designers will become some of those bubbles that are bubbling up. Uh, I, I hope that some of you start moving away from some of your, your corporate clients and, and start doing some of your work, maybe not all of it, but doing some of your work.